And what? You're saving us. You're gonna save us. Save Let's... me from the system. <laughs> oh my God! The systems are coming what, from Carolyn, inside the house. Him. Howdy! This is Chris. Back with Flip. We are going to talk some shiz. Did you get through that RFM thing? Yeah, this time I remembered to put it on one and a half speed, so that made it a lot easier to get through. <laughs> Do better. Do better. More empathy. More better. <laughs> We're going to try to do better. <laughs> so that's, does Kara live in Utah? Like, can we just... I think so. Can we just come out and talk about doing mushrooms now? I guess so. <laughs> okay. I added this word to the bottom of this. <laughs> <laughs> that's the... Uh, it's not uh, exactly crystals. and I mean, some of the meditation stuff, but the Sam Harris nihilism stuff... To me, is bordering on. I think they just play out the thing that Peterson always told them and warned them about: that you guys just end up doing religion, and that's uh, some of the points that I have here. We can yeah. watch. A... I haven't really listened to Harris in a long time. Me too. I got I got pretty bored and tired of him. Um, like I like a lot of this stuff. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's. I listened to that episode of where he reads the isis magazine article where they explain exactly what they want i listened to that thing like four times just because like i don't that that's the kind of thing that makes me crazy is that you know like isis told us exactly what they want and what they're doing and why they're doing it and what they think and the media like might as well i mean they obviously didn't read it or and and if they did they just kept playing dumb because like it's funny because like you know for so long like and sam harris points it out where like they mocked it, it's a joke on the left that George W. Bush said uh, they hate us for our freedom. And like it, ISIS published a magazine where they're like, yeah, no, that's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, we hate you for your freedom. Yeah. We do really hate you for your freedom, you know? The moment that's what he I like on... about Sam Harris is that like, you know, he was the only guy who would just come out and he read the whole thing with commentary, you know? And that's things like, just to make sure, I went and dug up, you know, it's hard to find, but I went and found a place that publishes the magazine online and I read it. It's ex exactly what Sam Harris read. There's a lot of stuff in this world of uh, not people not believing what those people say they believe. Right? <laughs> believe them that they what they say they believe, and that that actually goes. We've had the week of Rodney Meldrum this week. Even this nuance ho on RFM thing. The whole entire thing is they say they freak out because they talk to this guy. And they couldn't believe that they couldn't talk him into the science stuff. They couldn't believe that he believed those things that we all know Mormons kind of believe because we all grew up and have been in it and there's a moment of like a why did why are you guys getting shocked again that he believes what he says he believes like, what, what's yeah. going on and so i didn't listen to any of that rod meldrum guy well it's like 10 hours of stuff just because but, it, it got more interesting on the level of the interaction than it ever got on are we going to actually decipher anything about if the Book of Mormon happened in, in North America. So Kara's in Kara's summary in the RFM episode I just listened to, is that at all fair or accurate? Of what I, I didn't was finish about? I didn't finish everything yesterday. They did a long oh. one yesterday, and I'm only about a third of the way through it. They did finally start clarifying some stuff more, but John DeLynn, I think, did a terrible job in the interview. Once again, I, I'd say listen to Mormon Book Review's interview on it. But even there, it's, it's kind of not enough to get into nitty gritty of of why he believes where things happen. I guess maybe you'd have to get real deep into all of his different claims to ever even get any of that. But Delin and Kara just kind of kept derailing and charging him. And there was this, there was all this, we're not going to get into the science because we're not scientists. And then if he said any sort of thing, they'd say, that's not scientific. That's against the science. That's not science. And he'd say, well, actually this, no, we're not getting into it because we're, because we're not scientists. So like, like has happened so many times over the past two years since, uh, we're hitting the two year, or just hit the two year anniversary of things like uh, the coup. All these people say, the science says what I agree with, but we're not going to talk to science because none of us are scientists. But it says what I, what I believe and I agree with. Every time. Um, but the problem with that is, is they should have just let him talk. They should have just let him put his, his ideas out there. And now they've gotten to this point, this new activist way that when you go and interview, you have to interrupt the crap out of everything and bring up the ethical problem with it all the way through. And then I, I don't believe 
it could have gotten to a point where she says she left crying at the end of it that I highly doubt that because I'm sure that he just he just has general Mormon beliefs and just thinks that he came up with some descriptions for why those general Mormon beliefs the Book of Mormon may have happened around North America. That's that's it. That's really it. There's not extra. It's just it's just looking into a ton of construals about make trying to make it true or possible that that happened around North America. And tons of Mormons themselves might be against it just because they disagree with the uh, logistical claims of that. Hi, this is Paul. I wanted to do some more talking about faith deconstruction labels how we find ourselves in different places a lot of the videos lately have sort of been touching on that i, I clipped them i think i got out of the church trip because it was too depressing and i just felt like it had lost its way and it all it was doing was mimicking what you hear in liberal culture and not doing much more than that and it was just, it was uninteresting how long ago did this guy leave the church well this is a mormon stuff this is calvinist stuff or, oh. or protestant type things but i was just going to point to that because i like this because i think i think paul's the one who coined woking away and then he did i started saying deconstruction testimony before he did but he started he started saying it himself too but i just poke into the poking at this because um this part of it too is that some of the other people who are getting tired of the church itself getting woke uh are leaving because of those issues They're, it's like a two, it's a double-edged sword you got the caras leaving on the woke end and then the other side leaving it because the other the church is trying to appease it starting to be little bits of wokey too but like he said and what i agree most with there and the reason i even pulled that little clip not just a give credit for the woking way is that it's uninteresting it's it, we're gonna try to make it interesting here i mean the one thing that springs to my mind now is that apparently kara thinks that there's a dichotomy between orthodoxy and empathy <laughs> <laughs> so, okay but that's what that's, they always say they always say just use that empathy and that's like a magic cure all for all things i'd, I'd love to hear her define it because i'm guessing we'd get an ibram kendi style answer well, I frequently bring up the people, Paul Bloom's book, um, I think it's called Beyond Empathy or something, or like why empathy <laughs> causes problems. And it's, it's pretty, there's a lot of different reasons, but you can always simplify it down to the concept of a mama bear, if it infantilizes cubs, becomes very dangerous. And sometimes that mama bear ends up attacking everything around it and, and things that aren't even risks or dangers. Um, so it's not, it's not a free all card out of all. Yeah, and also, I mean, I suspect that there's a bit of a phenomenon with, uh, you know, wokey modern style therapy in the last couple decades where they're using empathy in the same kind of buzzword way. Because I, I know a couple of people who, who are complete, total emotional wrecks. And well, they say, oh, my problem is I have too much empathy. My therapist tells me so. And like, I know these people. I'm like, no, you're you're frankly sadistic. Empathy is the furthest thing. Too empathetic is the furthest thing away from what you are. You know, yeah, I just kind of wonder. Had, we had John Larson this week give us a list of logical fallacies, one on one <laughs> for a thousand dollars. And uh, he uh, pointed to weasel words. And, and I think it's true. Like a lot of this stuff on this end is weasel words too. Or it, it's even, it's why I pulled up that thing of, uh, put nihilism in that new agey stuff because even the way they start using nihilism it's new agey it's not nihilism it's it's, a, it's their new agey way and that's actually what i'm getting there i've got another clip from paul vanderclay about that just to show this one other thing to get it out the way too there was a while back i think i showed it but john delin and i think kara were were um recommending this podcast which is like this nihilism podcast <laughs> coming from the Lynn and from Kara. I listened to it and, and well, there, there's commentary on that later because of Paul, Paul Vanderclay points out the Sam Harris nihilism religion that's going on. <laughs> Cause that's, I don't think has anything to do with, well, what you said, it's buzzword nihilism. Yeah. Resilience. There's an, that's a big buzzword from the new oh. therapy movement authenticity yeah that's another one like authentic is the last thing you are oh that's simply something within your path 
exactly, your yeah. brain told you to take it and by taking it you're not the same person now that you were before is that too fast no or you read the book or watched the movie or read the newspaper or met that person and had that conversation you're now different and so you do show up differently and you can be the type of person who gravitates towards doing things that makes you different the next day but you you're really not using free will in any given moment the choice you made was the only choice you really could have made so they get on this extensive thing about about free will that to me is always kind of irritating i'm jumping a lot your perspective on free will and moral responsibility i am in favor of both okay. <laughs> um, i mean it's it, it's a huge area so yeah. not, but but there is inevitably a number of of people sam harris who you've obviously dialogued with don't believe there is free will and that does have implications for whether we can even speak of Sam, Sam and Brett have been button heads a whole lot through the, uh, since the, uh, hmm. the coup happened. <laughs> Blame or praiseworthiness to begin with. Um, yeah. What's yeah. Your take? Well, I should say that's a conversation I'm itching to have with Sam. Um, I think there's a lot to be said. I am pretty sure that if evolution is a fact, and I certainly believe that it is, um, that it proves that there is at least the basis for free will to exist. And I also think we all can demonstrate this in, in our lives. We can run relatively trivial experiments that demonstrate we must have free will. And that when somebody like Sam says that we don't, um, he's really talking about something else. It's a misdefinition of free will. Um, so I do believe that- He doesn't go into detail on that, but uh, that's what I agree with too, is, is I think that there, because there's limited choices in the world, that means there's no free will. And there's limited choices based on, on your being. But I also think that gets really cognitive dissonancy with these groups of people who kind of also think that we can basically redefine everything that we are down to ourselves and, and all these different uh there's no such thing as free will but some men or women because yeah, they exactly. feel that way and mm -hmm. they need to express it so they'll choose to well that's one of the the things in this whole podcast is she talks endlessly about choice. RFM even does a good job pointing out to her that she says, you sure talk a lot about choice for somebody who doesn't believe in free will. But yeah. it's, it's, it's a new agey, it's a new agey way of talking about it. It's just basically a new agey way of saying you have limited choices and that your, your genetics affect you, your, your birth situation affects you, your brain synapses affect you. Are we all in agreement that you chose to read the book? What do you mean by choose though? Yeah, what he, could have, he could have read any book you wanted, <laughs> watched a Hallmark movie. No. You could have read any book you wanted. There were some books that weren't even in your view. And then there were books that your brain told you weren't interesting. And there were other books that your brain said were interesting. And then your brain made a decision without you really consciously doing it. And you said, this is what you need to read for whatever your reasons are, because your parents. I See, this whole conversation, like part of the whole 10 years ago, I got into the whole free will determinism thing. And I just came out of it going, I don't know. And frankly, it doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> Yeah, ultimately you know? it doesn't matter. But secondly, I, I think it's just, it's basically the same thing as saying like, so you, you come to like a guitar fretboard and there's only so much you can do on that guitar fretboard and so much you can play. So then there's absolutely no choice from there. Yeah, that's, see, that, that's know? one obvious breakdown where it's like, no, that's not how, that doesn't seem to make sense at all. There's a million, million you know? choices and then there's choices within your capabilities at whatever sort yeah. of level. And, and so just saying that things are limited limited things are limited but because there's a limit if you can limit all the way down to a single question of yes or no and in some sort of question of yes i would like to do that or no i would not like to do that there is a choice in that single little question yes i would like this ice cream no i would not like that ice cream and i'm sorry yeah. i don't think that's predetermined <laughs> i don't know my favorite pithy quote about free will ever is christopher hitchens when he said of course we have free will the boss insists upon it <laughs> Satan is tempting that spirit and that you're constantly playing this mind game of like trying to stay with us, trying to keep the Holy Ghost with you always and obeying these dogmatic rules. And once you realize I have no evidence to believe that I have a spirit, it'd be nice. I have no evidence to believe that. I have no evidence to believe that um, me drinking a cup of coffee makes me more prone to like Satan tempting me to do other things in a slippery slope of <laughs> depravity. Like there's no Stephanie reason to believe those depravity. things. Yeah, sign me. I'm going to like other people. Just right now, Kara, you're striving to have empathy is a perfect analogy of striving to have the holy ghost you used to strive to have the holy ghost now you strive to have empathy it's the exact same thing you're doing the exact same thing yep yep and i'm gonna even show paul vanna clay makes a point about what how she talks about nihilism that in a weird way that's it's a strange kind of atonement moment for them the way they use nihilism <laughs> yeah
people don't want yeah, that. Yeah, she kind of says, like, like, well, I guess it relieves me of having to, it relieves me of actually having to dislike people for their choices because they don't, they didn't make them, I guess. That's kind of what she says, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's an answer out of all the negativity, but it, the, the problem with the nihilism is a double-edged sword is th that you don't get that the nihilism also erases the meaning. You <laughs> yeah, don't get that the, the nihilism also erases that you matter. The, yeah. You don't get that the nihilism <laughs> also erases that any of your little activism <laughs> is anything but a bug on a planet just scrambling around doing nothing. Once you once you once you end that worldview and you're like, okay, this I don't I don't believe that I have a spirit within me that came from a pre earth life, whether that's like the Mormon view or just any other religious view, it's it's, it's so hard for me. Like when when ex Mormons who still have moral values, and I think it's fine to have moral values. I mean, declare yourself an atheist just because you're waiting on proofs of things or or whatever. But if you go around announcing you're, you're this full on nihilist, but then you get outraged at, at the concept of of all sorts of concepts of death and reasons for dying, I do think that Peterson has a point in that, that, that just right in there, you're showing a little bit that, that there's meaning and there's matter in these types of things that, at least according to you, in the sense that you don't believe that, that things don't matter. They might not matter. We really might just be bugs <laughs> on a planet, but you believe that they matter. That's, that's the problem. You know? Yeah. And also I like that right there, she talks about the, the Mormon belief in a spirit, you know, and she doesn't like that. She's rationally opposed to that. And yet, like, I think Joshua Slocum from Disaffected Podcast did the best job of just laying out that the whole premise of transgenderism is that they have, a, is that you have a spirit. We have, there's, you have something separate and distinct from your body and biology, and that is your gender. Yep. I saw and the same that's point made on a spirit. I saw the that's same the metaphysical point, proposition. I saw the same point on trigonometry making that same point just yesterday. So I love, love, love listening to atheists, anybody else just debating these ideas and these concepts, because to me, this is the pinnacle of how we make laws in society, how we punish criminals, how we reform people, how we treat people, how we view mental health. Everything literally comes back to like, are humans the like actual <laughs> authors of all of their choices? Or are we more like computers that can be programmed? And if they have bad programming, we need to come at this from a different angle and just You're having again a few people ask if uh and maybe this did happen and i missed it if i was because i'm in the chat but um was free, has free will been defined there were several people saying that like, you haven't defined free will. Back to um you're Wait, right you're probably right is that a Conscious ukraine flag background being, um, i didn't even notice that choice. until now where that fourth lady that pops in that she popped out just now oh yeah it looks like it yeah. oh, okay <laughs> being imposed upon on you <laughs> she selected that out of free will I, that's, it's, that's something that has just been driving me crazy the last three weeks is like all of the same people that I saw pulling their hair out and screaming, he's going to start World War Three when Trump assassinated that Iranian terrorist in Iraq. And these are all people who couldn't name five facts about Iran or Iraq. Yeah. And, and all these same people just cannot wait for us to get directly militarily involved with the only nuclear power that can actually threaten us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's a tangent, but I don't know. <laughs> it's just, I remember when I was a kid reading 1984, I'm like, well, nobody's really this stupid. And like, no, now I'm old enough to go, oh, no, people are exactly that stupid. People are exactly that stupid to just misremember what they felt just days ago. And just believe, say the opposite thing. Don't you remember, brother? We've always been war hawks. <laughs> we've always been ultra patriotic. We've always believed in the integrity of borders. We've all these are all things that we've never ever had any issues with. It's getting it's getting to the mushroomy stuff. I might have started a little bit earlier because this is all still just more free will blather, which wasn't really the point. Yeah, but I, I have to admit, I'm a little bit surprised to hear that she did mushrooms and that she's just so open about it. Yeah, horses, including your thoughts, which aren't yours. Oh, my favorite thing. Keep talking. I'm going to look up something. That's okay. I may or may not have done them in the past. And when I did, I had the opposite experience of her, not in the sense of that I didn't feel loving and great and good and all that stuff. But I did not suddenly triple down into we're all one nihilistic whatever sort of thing. I, I did. If this happened, it didn't even happen. I can neither confirm nor deny that in any of the dozens of times I may or may not have done mushrooms that I did not experience what she did. But I had a lot. I was filled with love and joy and, and saw all that stuff, if that, that ever happened.
yeah forgiveness all that stuff yeah no i, I mean i did feel like a, an a immediate release of a lot of depression yeah. but of course but also that afterglow you know diminished quickly well, the half-life I, of that thing is pretty short i had a little bit of a sensation if it ever happened that they people do believe the things they believe and think they've seen the things that they, they've seen yeah like I, on people believe what on... they believe is something that yeah you come away with from mushrooms like oh wait other people's minds are working just like mine are well which is, yeah. <laughs> well not just that last time i was on midnight mormons i said uh, like maybe i've always been spiritually autistic or something like that maybe for a bad term of it or something but the thing was like what i'm saying is so many people report these feelings and these experiences and i never oh, yeah. felt them i never felt anything like that until, no, I, yeah. until i had the, the exact same experience happen. like you know I, i've said before that like i I was never, ever, I almost, I didn't pray much. I was very bad at praying to the, the silent private prayer, like the, the public prayer I was great at. Cause that's performative. That's easy. That's just words. But uh, the like private prayer, I sucked at it. And because I could never shake the feeling that I was just bouncing thoughts off the inside of my skull, just could not get around that. You know, I was pretty young when I had that feeling of like, well, wait a second. Like I, I, all the things I'm supposed to feel about the spirit are things I feel when I watch Jurassic park you know and all that stuff and yeah i kind of like you i feel like spiritual autistic but yeah mushrooms i was like oh that's what it's like that to, to, to not feel the that, presence but... of a of its great spirit exactly and then and that um there's more going on than my eyes are filtering and, and that type of stuff you know and uh i just said i, I remember yeah. the first time that it didn't happen i said i I believe that they believe. I believe everyone believes, and the hippies were right too, and stuff yeah. like that. At the same time, I was just, I was, I was also processing that it was even more, maybe my brain or something. It's just I, I, I believe that people could have those sensations or something like it, even without the uh, thing. Yeah, and, no, and I, the... I can neither confirm nor deny that one day I was in my tiny studio, and and I did this stuff, and in in one trip, like I was lying in my bed looking at, and it was a tiny little place it's like 400 square feet little hovel that i lived in and and i watched as my ceiling opened up into a great cathedral with where i watched um, monsters devouring the, the, like snakes and morphing into other things and, and like i saw the book of revelations play mm -hmm. out on my ceiling you know and then later on um uh, some rock and roll music made it so i couldn't move out of my chair you know like i was struck dumb I yeah. couldn't move or speak, you know, I, like, oh, I, it's a religious experience. I had experiences of feeling there was like a large, positive tiger headed man standing in the corner of the room staring at me. With it, and I'm like, this is this is Egyptian as hell. You know what <laughs> I mean? And, uh, um, and I completely also believe because I, I one time did or did not do them with, with a yogi, a yoga instructor person who goes and does the hot, quiet yoga for several days. And it was her first time that that she did or did not do them and she said i feel like i like i get i get there like this is one of the reasons i like that big crazy yoga stuff is i, I kind of get to this realm in that in that like i can compare the two i've gone and done these long hot yoga crazy hot things and that and i've gotten to these hallucinatory levels in in that wow. and I, I i don't know if it's like one for one but just like something similar you know what are the chances we can get John DeLynn to maybe confirm or deny that he ever did mushrooms? <laughs> well, I, I doubt. He says he hasn't even drank, man. No, oh, yeah, no, that guy is such a, I don't know, like, he really, he would have made a great politician for sure. Yeah. Like, he's got that, the got uh, that milk toast life. There was one of those things that uh, Joe Rogan's, one of his best jokes on stage, it was actually a stage joke, not just from his podcast, he said he wanted, like, take bill clinton and sitting him in a room and make him do a bunch an overdose of mushrooms and like just have this thing in the moment he goes oh what did i do you know, something like that. the same thing would probably happen with it. but there's also the old uh terrence mckenna thing that, that he said with the mushrooms and all that stuff once you've got the message you can hang up the phone that's kind of one of the nice things about it is it's not really addictive in that yeah. sort of way and uh if she's doing them all the time i don't know what what She's getting out of it continuously. But. Yeah, I don't. I think it's been it's been more than five years since I may or may not have done any of that. Me too. Huh? And I I had a little stint where I did it a bunch of times, not like right yeah. below, but across a few years. That yeah, I did exactly. Not, like did I or did not. I may or may not have done it a few dozen times in a span of about seven years. 
Yeah, uh, outside of the with uh, big bat with like big gaps in between, long gaps, and then you know, because you know how it is, you may or may not get a bag of them, and that means you've got some for a while until you don't. It's probably easier for us to even admit or not admit that we've done them because it's been <laughs> long enough. Whereas she's yeah. saying, she's basically we got statue of limitations. <laughs> she's basically gargling them on stream here. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, she, like that's the thing is like I listened to her on one and a half, and even and on one and a half she was really clipping along, and yeah. so yeah, she's 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 got a little afterglow on you can it totally makes sense yeah well if they're not mine who are they nothing against that like hooray like it's a nice feeling to have that day after mushrooms feeling i'm gonna say something here i appreciate rfm in this episode like i people have told me that the guy's a little bit more uh, logical than i mean i haven't not said that he's logical but that he'll challenge stuff and i think he did challenge little bits here in, in kind of like a nice way the problem is Very i think bit. i think he, i think he should be more like streeter where if you're going to be this hardcore, we're going to do everything just about truth and logic and empiricism and, and the old classical. I think he is a classical thinker. It's just don't pick and choose, fella. Like Yeah. Well, oh, that was something that struck me, though, was like, because, you know, Kara says, like, it, how amazing. I really respect that Meldrum guy for coming in and sitting down and talking to us for 10 hours and letting the two of us basically attack every little part of his cherished belief system. Which is like, yeah, Kara, what are the chances that you or John would be willing to sit down with me and Chris while we dismantle yours? We're all on the attack. We, yeah. we, we but there's a difference questions. is that Meldrum is honest enough, A, to show up and, and be attacked. And also, that's the other thing, like I've said a million times, why I have way more respect for the Mormons than I do for the Delinians, the woke ex-Mormons, is that the Mormons admit they're doing religion and the wokies pretend that they're not yeah and that's a big difference because you know that's why and that's the thing is like that's why john and kara don't think that they need to answer to the stuff that we pick on them about because for them like well, we're just rational science based they're, it's just they're rational unaware science. of it and we should yeah. do a whole episode on lars and i was gonna pull up later we might not have time for it but the problem oh, yeah. is is like like and somebody was even some people were even messaging me when, when Larson was live saying I can't wait for you guys to talk about this stuff and I know you picked up on some of the issues but the ultimate issue is where this all started where I went after Larson is that they're just completely blind to to how they do it themselves and how they're yeah. I mean this is religion themselves Larson was blind to how he's he himself has those logical fallacies that, that he complains about even though he'll try to make mention of saying even I'm susceptible to this he he still doesn't just see it when it, when it's sitting right yeah. there in front of him. Hey, Bill. Um, but part of that issue is too. I think maybe because Delin and Larson and and Bill are all kind of old school guys, and there's something about watching all of them, especially listening to this Sam Harris stuff. You like you said, I got into all this stuff ten years ago, and then I I passed it up. And you you and I did. It's it's like. They make fun of the Mormon church in this episode. The Mormon church is always 20 years behind something and then they catch up with the times. In the world of like atheism <laughs> advancement or whatever, you guys feel the exact same way. The ex-Mormons feel the exact same way to me. Like they're just catching up to the to the atheist conventions of the 2005. <laughs> yeah. you know, they're, they're 15 years behind on this stuff and they don't yeah. get that it's advanced into this, this extremely wokish type weird postmodern fight and they don't even know that the postmodern fight is there yeah there's also just like i mean i mean i get that there's always people i mean there's always a new batch of people but like yeah. really fallacies 101 i just like can't i just link you to um for, for one thousand to skeptoid yeah i can just link you to skeptoid from 15 years ago mm. where he put these all into really excellent little 15 minute chunks they're not yours because here like if you just close your eyes and try to be present if you just watch how your brain works, thoughts will arise and disappear without any effort on your part. I was there at the uh, RFM debate with Midnight Mormons, and I overheard Bill and his friends talking about how they're all into Buddhism now. Huh. Yeah. Try to try to have that. Which Sam Harris kind of is, too. I mean, this is really kind of yeah. I actually, I mean, just recently I was doing my dorking, falling asleep to Wikipedia walks thing, and I learned that apparently, like, within Hinduism, going back centuries or even millennia there's like two basic branches within hinduism one which is theistic and one which is atheistic that's, but still totally hinduism <laughs> like that's, i had no that's idea that's true of that's true of buddhism too 
Yeah. Well, I mean, see, I always knew that many Buddhists are atheistic. And Most some Buddhists are, are atheistic. No, so there's Buddhists that are that are full deal uh, non-atheists too. Yeah. I, I mean, go give it a listen and then come back next week and let us know if you've changed your mind, if there is no free will. I do want to say, though, as we conclude this part of the conversation, um, Sam makes the argument, and I think he's right, if we understand that there isn't free will. It makes a greater case for things like redemption because you understand somebody is really doing the best they can. Compassion, forgiveness, it cuts through the logic of retribution. You see how you see how I start talking about this nihilism starts becoming like atonement type stuff, but it, it gets yeah. even worse. And that's his words, and it helps us approach behavior change much more efficiently. Once you understand that people are just doing the best they can, to affect change, you have to give them new tools. You have to change the thoughts that are going in their head. So they can... the, the opposite is also true. Any of the good yeah. they're doing is just... <laughs> Yeah, and also, but it also, I mean, it like you say, it just totally has the ring of like, you know, once you understand your role in the plan of salvation, it'll help you make better choices and have more empathy and love and forgiveness and redemption. You want to be like us, don't you? Well, you have to believe the things we do because I just explained to you how one follows from the other. Yeah. <laughs> can make different decisions and it, it ends up being much more impactful um, if you approach it this way. Anyway, this is starting to sound like a clockwork orange to me. Mm. Clockwork orange. Change the thoughts inside their heads. Yeah. Uh, you add new information. That's a good challenge in the sense of watch that movie again. It's been you, a while. Oh gosh, I love that movie. I've seen that. That might be one of the movies I've it seen. It's the most. ultraviolence. <laughs> Gather around. Come listen to Uncle. Listen to <laughs> Devil Trombone. And <laughs> when you're talking like systemically, kind of, you're talking about like a worldwide problem of people being brainwashed to think that like caring about the environment, let's say, is not a priority because Jesus is coming back and everything's going to be wiped out. Like to change a wide scale programming of people that yeah it's kind of you you have to attack things from a systemic view because you can't that, that, that's cognitive dissonance to you right? like yeah. you can program them even though they're unprogrammable because there's no free will also there is like this is that, that i'm glad you played this clip because this one bothered me is and this is a common thing where the upper middle class who probably as a demographic are basically responsible for the lion's share of environmental damage think that because if they keep talking about how concerned they are they're the ones who care about the environment like no farmers care about the environment Kara. you have no you don't understand the environment hunters care about the environment because they understand it in a way that you don't understand it you know and like that's just one of those things that like and, and that's things for her you know this is obviously it's obviously one of her little religious bugaboos because for her, a good, righteous person is someone who cares about the environment, not like Mormons who believe that Jesus is coming back. Yeah. You know, but there's a there's a second authoritarian level that he's saying, like, I think is like clockwork orange. We can put this and we can make you think the way we want you to think, which I actually ultimately think is a critique of Sam Harris, too, because I think that seeps out in Sam Harris. And there's always this idea from the, the thinking class that they've got the answers and they're going to be able to figure out the answers and then they're going to be able to incept this program. They're going to be the ones who, who program these non-free will people into being better and doing better. The, you're, you're outside of it. You guys are outside of it and you're programming. You're capable of programming everybody else. Who's... Yeah, well, they're not outside of it. They're just on the side of people with empathy and who are for and advance the cause of empathy. Hmm. People's conditioning is going to condition them to some really backward, stupid ideas unless you do things at a wider systemic scale is my whole bag. Then, then we must ultimately come to that. I also think like, you say you're a nihilist and atheist and you're Sam Harris stuff. And uh, Sam Harris, I think Sam Harris, I, most of my problems with Sam Harris, they're not like angry problems. They're just differences in his moral philosophy. I think his moral philosophy has problems and I've seen people try to explain Hume to him and he just refuses to accept Hume in the sense of he thinks that he can cross that bridge of the is and the ought. He's just positive that he can do it with science, that he, he can figure out the difference between what we should do and what exists in science. When he's talking about systems and systems and systems, Sam's Harris, Sam Harris is not being Foucauldian. Does that make sense? Sam Harris is yeah. not a Foucauldian. When she talks about systems, the systems, the systems, she's being, she's yeah. being the typical Foucauldian. No, um, like the way Kara uses system is the, like the way that um, evangelical Christians use worldly. Yeah. When Sam uses system, he's smarter than that. He's really talking about something. He's just, I think it's something that he 
thinks he might be able to do something about that I don't think he knew very much about, like like most of the systems, but he's talking about moral systems. And those moral systems are probably harder to change than it, as hard to change it is to change an entire genetic code. But um, she is talking about the same systems that the crit theorists are talking about. And I don't, I don't know how aware of it she is or not. Like she blends the world of them. Well, yeah, and just talking about how people absorb things unawares, um, mm -hmm. like I don't even remember, but on a, like a pro Mormon Facebook group that I lurk in, like somebody today just posted a long thing. I don't even remember what it was in exactly talking about, but he talks about late capitalism and neo feudalism, you know, and then like, and I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, you're not, you're obviously not a Marxist, but that's Marxist. You are, <laughs> yeah. Like, you don't realize it, but you're doing Marxism right now, but like, and you can tell, like, this is, it, like it seemed like an active mormon perspective you know a guy trying to make sense of the world like somehow late capitalism that concept of late capitalism and neo-feudalism leaked into your brain somehow yeah and i mean some of that is because the zeitgeist is so popular I, I ran into the same issue that me and another friend had another friend of ours who was talking to me about late stage capitalism and all that stuff. And I didn't mention anything, but like later I said to him, like, you know, those like, those are Marxist concepts. You think he's a Marxist? He's like, no, I don't think he's a Marxist. I'm like, well, he was using those words, yeah. but um, they, they probably don't know those words, but it's the same thing. People use bourgeoisie and proletariat. It's one of my biggest like complaints. One of the biggest issues in basic postmodernism, the original postmodernist, people always say they were technically critics of Marxists and, and even flushed Marx down the drain. But then why did they still constantly talk about everything in terms of the proletariat and bourgeoisie as if that's the proper way to to even visualize the. Uh... Yeah, like they only flush Marx down the drain the way Mormonism flushed Brigham Young down the drain. <laughs> yeah. It's like the stuff that didn't work and that we're embarrassed about, we're not on board with, but. Everything else is it's still a, there. It's there. We're still work, <laughs> we're still working on the the ideas there. The way Rod yeah. Meldrum, like saying that these modern Marxists aren't Marxists, is like saying Rod Meldrum's not a yeah. not a Mormon. Yeah, and it's like it's like, it's like yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. The question is to who will decide what thoughts to change. Me? Can I do it? Can I? Sure. Can I try? You're up for it. All right. <laughs> You're you the influencer know. here. What do you have next? Can I oh, wait? Are we moving on? That, that's a, see, RFM's a smart dude. <laughs> And that's that's a little bit of a zing too. The like influencer, you're an influencer in the world where there's no free will. <laughs> no, no, please feel sure. Okay. All right, I just in case anyone wanted another good definition in Sam Harris's book, he says the popular conception of free will seems to rest on two assumptions: one that each of us could have behaved differently than we did in the past. Okay, so it was that, and two that we are the conscious source of are, are the conscious source of most of our thoughts, actions in the present. So. Those are two things that um, I don't believe in. And then um, everyone just sit with that, go look at some resources, just think about the ideas. I actually spoke um, at a youth event for like ex-Mormon teens back in the summer. And I talked about my favorite things, which is dogma and free will. And it's a dangerous territory. Can you imagine putting your, would you put your kid in front of I, Jared speaking I, about dogmatism and free will? First off, youth event for ex-Mormon teens. Like, damn it. Just go to Lagoon with your friends. <laughs> Like, that's all you need, teenagers. There's a lot of crazy stuff in the news nowadays that they're putting kids in front of. It's so like an EFY for ex-Mormons? But it's Really? Like somewhere on that list of things I would not send, like all of my nephews and kids, they said, hey, we've got this uh, workshop over here of Jared talking about free will and nihilism. Like, no thanks. <laughs> nope. We're in the it's past. Just like, just, it's, it's just exactly like the fireside. Do you, oh, did you ever listen to that link? I sent you the link of that rock and roll fireside guy. Because... You don't even have to listen to the whole thing in the first 10 minutes. You would love it. It's like within the first seven minutes, but the guy's up there and like, you can tell he's like, he's like an old Idaho farmer type. And, uh, you know, he's talking to these kids in like the eighties about rock and roll. And he's talking about witchcraft. He's like, I'm not here to talk to you about rock and roll. I'm here to talk to you about devils and witchcraft. And he has this thing where he says, you know, um, like now if you've got an image of a devil or a witch, like from the movies, like a scraggly person or fangs and horns and devil, we're going to have a problem because that's not what a witch looks like. You want to know what a witch looks like? And there's a pause. This is a witch. Yoko Ono. <laughs> 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 wife Barry. of the wife of John Lennon. And John Lennon is a warlock. Chuck like, Berry would have agreed. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> oh gosh. But yeah, good. that's basically the equivalent of having Kara talk to your kids. Having that guy talk to your kids about witch and witchcraft and having Kara talk to your kids about 
philosophical things like free will. Oh, my oh gosh. God. Teenagers, but it's fun because it just is about like explore ideas that you've never thought about before. You probably your whole life thought, Hey, kids, did you think that maybe none of this matters and there's no meaning? In <laughs> Have you ever and had that thought, teenage person? Even if you go off into the bush over there and spy on the naked girls, that wasn't you because you had no control over not doing that. Enjoy your day, kids. Oh, she's a Calvinist. She's a, she's a nihilistic Calvinist. Yeah. And huh. I'm going to have the Calvinist point that out. And the, I got another little clip of that right after this. That if you're just coming out of the church, you thought things this way, just listen to some podcasts, listen to some books, open yourself to other philosophical thoughts on this is all I want to say is like, don't take my word for it, guys. This is just what I, uh, this is the truest thing to me that resonates and it, yeah. it helped me literally. Like, I'd like to bear my testimony. I know I have no free will. <laughs> <laughs> my genes make me bear my testimony. I know I have no and, free will. And I know it's true because it makes me feel like it's good and right. <laughs> I fell from the Mormon church. So it's really powerful. So um, I give a good like stamp of approval to that. So it's probably a good endorsement for people to go investigate these ideas more on their own. Well, I will tell you, I never would have looked at this except for the fact that you're on the show tonight. Yay. And so I got some links that Bill provided and I looked at it and I thought, oh my gosh, this is like a concept. This is an argument that I had never even heard of before. And I do find it fascinating and stimulating. See, that's a little bit weird to me of people who've been in like the ex, the ex religious space so long to have never come across this whole free will debate stuff. I mean, I don't know, because like maybe we're a product of our times. Do you remember the Reasonable Doubts podcast from way back in the day? They did like 180 episodes. It was like some psychologists and whatnot. Anyway, they they did a great a bunch of great podcasts on basically atheism and religion, but very scholarly. And they had a whole series on free will and determinism, and it was some of the best stuff on the subject I ever heard, which is also how, like, after listening to all that, I came away going, I, I don't know, because, you know, these were good, serious, not very axe-grindy people who were just really going into it, like, you know, they are college professor types from before the time, I don't know, you had, like, maybe if I go, like, I remember they were kind of lefty even back then, but, like, I don't remember them being at all uh, wokey, um, the name but of that it. was a really good series Reasonable. yeah i put a link in the thing to the to their whole site like you can search that for free will and determinism and find all the episodes they talked about because i mean they talked about a lot of great stuff because one of the guys was a researcher who specifically did research on religion and religiosity and it was really fascinating he did a lot of great science stuff and then there was a philosopher guy in it but like yeah that's like if you're if you want a good conversation on free will and determinism i would point people to that so I've never, I've never been, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, I've never been that crazy interested in the, uh, the whole conversation debate. And I've listened, listened here and there. And I usually just immediately go, it just doesn't matter. You have to live in your life. As yeah. It doesn't matter. The, the, the question, is there free will and, and is there a God? It's the same thing. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Ultimately it doesn't matter. It clearly doesn't matter. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I guess people get caught up in that being interesting. And maybe if you're getting wild into that being interesting, but well, yeah, I spent a few years being interested in it and then now I'm, yeah. I'm just but I do it. think people who want to buy into it have to also understand that they're also usually ten tentatively the type of people who get upset at the concepts that Peterson talks about, about like personality traits and what your body is and who you are and, and yeah. what your, biology matters in in determining bits and pieces of of yeah. how you think and who you are and i i fully agree and understand that's why i say it's like a limited choice world but yeah. but so yeah robin d'angelo doesn't believe in free will either but yes i 100 percent believe the concepts of big five personality not that they're exactly right because all that sort of stuff is a soft science but they're i'm stuck in this body and there's truth to what this body, different processes of this body are going to alter how I view and see and, and, and think about different things. But all those things, I think it's just to an extent. It's just to an extent. It's not as a, yeah. just like the postmodernist stuff. I mean, all, all these different ideas, most of the different ideas, I think you and I have talked about it before. Like they're great. Anything's a good lens. It's a good lens. But it, any yeah. one of these things, if you think you found the all encompassing answer and this lens just stays on now. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit like playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. We're going to pretend, but we're going to pretend seriously. Yeah. We're going to really, really commit to the pretend, 
but we're never going to forget that at one point we're going to take it all off and stop pretending yeah and then get back to real life figure we can learn a thing we can we can take a view of a thing in any given moment we might say hey i remember this one lens that might work in this situation yeah no like uh, you know i love like strategy war games type thing and like you know it's fun like oh this is what it feels like to you know be an evil dictator i'm gonna yeah. you know like I, you know like civilization is one of those great games i've loved them i played them all the way back since the early 90s and it's fun because like at the start of the game sometimes i'll like you know i will say okay this time i'm going to try to be the nicest i'm just going to be nice you know or you can say yeah. like this time i'm going to be ruthless you know and like and the fact is that usually when you do that it doesn't work one way or the other if you're playing yeah. on difficult levels like the reality is you have to sometimes you have to be nice sometimes you have to be yeah, ruthless yeah. you can't be you can't hold to some universal yeah. answer yeah. exactly and about uh think about something uh what that you would have done differently in your past isn't that what you said uh that if you ask me the closest argument in the world to me that there is some sort of larger religious thing to this whole world is that concept of just how unfigureoutable it is. It just like all seems so perfectly, if you think you got it figured out all the way on this one thing, there's going to be an issue down at yeah. the end of that, that you got to switch to the other thing. I just watched a thing last night of a physicist talking about physics, you know, po popular science for dummies about physics. And uh, I think it was PBS. I don't know anyway, but he, you know, he made a good analogy about how like the fundamental forces really is just the end of the chain of a kid going but why but why but why <laughs> and that thing is like you know like what's up with the you know electromagnetic force just because yeah, yeah. that's that's the end of the chain of why just because that's why I, I sometimes point and say to people that philosophy all most philosophy gets really weird because almost any single philosopher you have is like a person who has this really good concept and this idea and it's a new way of thinking about things, even the postmodernists or whatever, but you can even talk about the logical positives and they have this idea that rationality works, this idea works, this thing works, but those guys are all super intense all the way to the end with the thing that they think they found. And every single one of them goes, tries to go all the way to the end of it. And the next thing you know, I have the logical positives trying to change all of language into a mathematical symbol thing, like Wittgenstein or something like that. And after a minute, you're like, okay, dude, like, it's like you gone too far. You know, yeah. you're not, you're, you're not going to solve it, you know? Well, and then, I mean, cause that just reminds me of, uh, there's a, it's a crazy thing. I forget what it's called, but that, that guy who shot up, um, that, uh, shot that Senator in Arizona, Jared Loeffner, mm. like he believed like, and it was an idea he picked up from somebody else. It's related to the sovereign citizen movement, but it is a guy that tries to make like the perfect mathematical language, not mathematical, but like a form of English language that is entirely like without ambiguity it's completely insane like you dig into yeah. it and you can see that you have to be completely nuts to go that far and that's where i have I, I do like some religious language i think it was some good ideas that came out of religion and the concept is there's some ideas from religion that the person who thinks they can figure it out the all figuring out answer the the, the thing that's all the answers is is the devil I mean, that's, yeah. that's that's ultimately what one of the things i like out of their uh their view just now said yeah about consider something that you would have done differently. In your yeah, past. that free will is the idea that you could have you could have done something differently in your past. I'm one of the few people who has actually done something differently in my past. You What's have a time machine. About? Sit with that. <laughs> actually, okay. he's just trolling. Her. Uh, hey, make it full screen again. Can I tell you guys something? Yeah, come on. What, full screen. Okay, you guys. I was thinking about something super duper hippy dippy last night. Oh no, I don't need that kind of full screen. Not, I don't have this. I don't need that kind of space. Zoom in for the close up, Bill. Listen to this. Listen. She's even got her lava okay, lamp guys, in the corner, huh? I was thinking about how strange it is. This is, I am not spiritual. I'm like pretty hard. I'm pretty like six out of seven kind of atheist. You guys know me, Oh, right? you're pretty but spiritual. Was... Yeah, you're not a six you're out just, of seven. You just don't call it spiritual, but you're very spiritual. You're a four out of seven. <laughs> thinking because I've been doing a lot of mushrooms lately and so many coincidences have been occurring. And again, I'm... She's going to explain why she's a four out of seven. Right. I noticed her of the coincidences. I'm not like putting things into motion. But something about mushrooms, guys, something about mushrooms is interesting. But I was just thinking uh, last night as I was falling asleep how that it feels like the, I, from the paradigm of no free will, okay? I'm kind of going on, on like a very high venture here, so please bear with me. But in the idea that there's no free will, it almost feels like my instinct to take mushrooms and have life-altering realizations that make me a whole new person and make my husband like a whole new person, okay? No exaggeration, like two years of depression for him, like <laughs> wiped off the map almost. So I'm trying to say like, 
I feel like my instincts to do mushrooms and become a better person and have a healthier marriage and have a healthier life. It feels like that wasn't even my choice to do, but then there's all of the things that goes in to that mushrooms even arriving in my hand to be able to take it. And just like the molecules, the atoms that grew that mushroom somewhere out, wherever it was grown, the water that it came from, the, uh, like the fertilizer that was used, every single thing that, that is part of my experience to advance as a human all came. She was having a, she was having a temple video moment at the <laughs> start of the temple video. <laughs> In her bed. Came from like, oh, remember that music? <laughs> one million bajillion to the millionth degree of previous events that occurred of like the rain fell here and this and that came on a truck here. And there's so many things that go into the reasons why I am the way that I am right now. That I. The uh, Terrence Malick movie, what's it called? It's called Life or something like that. Kind of seems like that. that. The whole entire movie is, it's almost like temple video type stuff of just showing the earth and things come together. And that all boils down to. Brad Pitt and his kids having a fight in the, in their room or something like that, but it, it's trying to like take this uh, larger view of the universe all coming down to this moment. It had nothing to do with, and just sitting with that, that like I'm not. This is not like a spiritual thing necessarily, but just how cool it is that there are so many forces, that the world is so big, and that there are just like atoms and molecules that have been like working, that have been on this planet for you know billions of years that I'm now taking into my body that give my brain an advancement it didn't have before. An advancement. That's all I have to say about that. And if you're a nihilist. It was just a freaking moment in time, and that's that. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> – because that's one of the things about having possibly or maybe not have done mushrooms a couple dozen times um, is like – because every time I may or may not have done them, there's always a moment, usually like like 80 to 90% of the way toward peaking. I always have a moment where I, where I am in the exact same – spot like there's a it's a unitary spot there's, there's a notion room time there's like, a notion that this was always coming like yeah. this already this already happened where, and this was always where, coming. like and i always have a moment where i'm like i don't remember which of i can't tell which of the few dozen trips i've been on i'm on now like there's just this and it always flashes and then it like it lasts i don't know in mush again mushroom time i don't understand mushroom time but mushroom time exists in space and time so it has to have a value but like, yeah, I have this moment of unit unity where like I, I am exactly where I was the first time I may or may not have done mushrooms with you. What was that? It may or may not have been 13, 14 years ago. I don't know. It was a while. Yeah. Uh, where were we? Uh, on when you live, you may, may, you may or may not have lived in an old Victorian mansion that oh, was yeah. divided into apartments <laughs> up near the university. Yeah. That was a great, great place to live that was a cool building yeah it was, i just remember i i was cracking me up that everywhere you lived looked like you it was a motel six yeah i live i live like lenny, like, lenny I, made the, I made the joke that there were there were there are more basic amenities of life in a motel six <laughs> than in chris hannah's apartment it was a fairly big and decent apartment i had nothing in it <laughs> it was a beautiful place yeah you ever seen the simpsons maybe i'll clip it here with me walking on lenny like don't tell him how i live yeah that's but, i've seen it <laughs> But I wasn't. I also wasn't embarrassed of that. I'm a minimalist. Yeah. And, you know that nihilism episode told me I should be a minimalist. I'm doing it for for nihilistic Jesus. Talking about the butterfly effect. Am I? Oh, a variation of it. Which, that... Interestingly enough, was enunciated the first time to my knowledge by Malcolm in the movie that you See, mentioned. At he the outset. mentioned this movie, and for I like an idiot actually thought of the movie Butterfly Effect with Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> <laughs> you like, thought of it? Did you really culture. see that? That thing was terrible. A, they thought of the less cultured. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did. I'm like, oh, that's right. I forgot about Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. He said, Malcolm, I'm thinking Clockwork Orange because it's starring Ian Malcolm. <laughs> yeah, because he's talking about um, Goldblum. Yeah. Yes, is the character called that. Malcolm is he, in that? Is, is Jeff Goldblum's character Malcolm? I think he's called Malcolm, yeah. yeah. Oh. Circle here. And, anyway. And Ian Malcolm's the actor, the main actor of Clockwork Orange. Like, so, like, when Jeff Goldblum acts, like, they should just shortcut it and just name his character jeff gold uh, uh, yeah i'm gonna I'm try to do but if i did an impersonation now it'd just be a kyle dunnigan rip off <laughs> yeah so, um, um what you have chaos and life finds a way yes yes yes, yes. how does he do yes, it? i don't yes, know yes, how kyle yes, dunnigan yes, does yes, it yes. if kara gets like one chance i've had a really shitty day you guys know so if i get a chance to like say anything about anything kara doesn't free will is an illusion go listen to cognitive business podcast find mushrooms, do mushrooms. yeah this and... will cheer you up <laughs> do drugs kids Kara you know, said do drugs. You remember that thing when like Dana Carvey would like figure out an impersonation because he was such a good impersonator, but the reason he's a good impersonator is because it wouldn't be very, it, 
it wouldn't be that exact. It'd kind of be just more the essence of the person. But yeah. then pretty soon, everybody's impersonation was Dana Carvey's impersonation of the person. Yeah. I'm seeing that happen Not with Kyle Dunnigan. Not that. That's Kyle the thing. Like, I remember the first Bush talking like Dana Carvey now. Not yeah. gonna debt. But then, Not if anybody else that. does a Bush impersonation, they do a Dana Carvey Bush impersonation. You know, yeah. and uh, it's happening with Kyle Dunnigan. I see all over the place people kind of start trying to rip off Kyle Dunnigan. Kyle Dunnigan is special, though. That guy is really excellent. He sounds really close to him and voice and stuff. And then whatever else we're gonna talk about next, Dogma yeah. is the enemy. Those are those are that's like my church doctor. <laughs> okay, so you don't want to be dogmatic just, about not having free will. Then. I, I want to um, hear her define dogma because I think we're gonna get a Kendi answer. There was an answer in it earlier. It's just kind of like it was like strict hardcore beliefs or something. But he just made the point there, like you're not gonna be dogmatic about free, not having free will, are you? No, because that 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 would be dumb. I, would I, be I didn't come. I didn't come. But this is where she'll uh, she'll appeal to the nihilism as the atonement. Out of this whole religion, just to be dogmatic again about anything. <laughs> and I appreciate that. And hopefully I'm not either. The thing about, you talk about the atoms that make up the mushrooms and all these things converging to you taking them and coming to your hands. I want you to know one thing, okay? Why is it that you can never trust atoms? Because, oh, there's a joke. I know there's a punny joke in here. Because they make up everything. everything. <laughs> Thank you. That's a little uh, nod to the new Ghostbusters movie, which actually was better than I expected. There's a new Ghostbusters movie? A new new one? Ghostbusters Did you life, watch it? I didn't watch it. I, I saw it. It was all right. And, and definitely, like, they overdid the fan service in that one, I'd say, a little bit. Uh, to be honest, <laughs> I haven't watched a movie in, like, three years. Yeah. Oh, well, you haven't seen this one. It was delayed for a long time because, you know, the COVID thing, there was this pandemic. And they finally released it, and you can you can watch it now on your streaming service. And, uh, yeah, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. It was actually better. There's this girl in it. She's 12 years old in the movie. The girl does a pretty good job of impersonating Bankman. Hmm. Give her credit for it. She actually carries the entire movie. She's incredible. Mm. All right, an endorsement from the very top. You guys heard it here first. Yeah, I can't remember her name, and I apologize for that, but she's she's good. See, that's you know how that works. So is, did you see Super Eight? Yeah. Because that that girl in Super Eight, I don't even know, I can't name her now. I don't know if she's been anything else. Like I saw that movie, I'm like, oh well, she's gonna win every Oscar for the next fifty years because yeah. she just killed it in that movie. But I, I guess so. Not. If that girl, she was in Haunting of Hill House which is done by the director, Mike Flanagan, who is the director of the next show that I'm going to talk about to make this nihilism uh, point that Van does. It's Those weird are, how art reflects life. Those are loose connections that Here, you're talking. my, uh, my non-free will made happen in my brain. About taking care of the environment. It was when I let go of the idea that Jesus isn't coming back. And then I would see things like this, which is there are places in the world where there's so much trash oh, that it gosh. just fills the river. Look at that. And there are places in the ocean where there's just giant islands of plastic. And it's only going to get worse, right? We've I done that in a lot. Let's go mission. look in your kitchen right now, buddy. I served my see mission who's right producing there. The... <laughs> 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 last 200 years, actually last 100 years. And so it becomes insane. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, a, that's, that's a good answer to that. It yeah. becomes insane. I think Guatemala. Oh, wow. That's the it's answer. like literally know. that's a representation like whether it's the earth or your life it's like people we we know we get only one earth and there's a finite amount of look at their rooms like how much plastic came out of just the stuff that's yeah. in the room. resources on it absolutely Same thing with your life you get a finite amount of years we know for sure this is the only planet we get we know for sure like this is this is a religious appeal yeah you're not going to do anything else other than pray to the pray to the uh green gods this is your life there might be an extra one there might be a bonus room but for sure like take control to bring it back to something that sounds very opposite to free will but you guys know what i mean like yeah investigate the things and the reasons why you do the things you do the religion that you adhere to the reasons like you love or why like how if you... yeah kara why are you weirdly obsessed with how gay people are treated compared yeah. to anyone else and you can actually look into any sort of that stuff if you had a little bit of a chance to step back a little bit you'd understand most of those in-group biases or even Perhaps yeah. the concept of disgust with homosexuality probably comes from our evolutionary buildup. And it is something I think that we can, people can get on top of, but to. to... Yeah. Somewhere in this, as she's talking about that Meldrum <laughs> guy, and I don't remember exactly what she says, but she says something that she's reflecting a, a common trope out there, which is like, it's like white people are the kind of people that were opposed to race mixing. You know, no. uh, unlike every other kind of people ever that were not at all opposed to mixing cultures, that that's not how anybody has ever worked ever. Like so. beyond the, the Sam Harris free will concept, you just get back into the basic evolutionary concept of it. That 
there's, even, it, there's going to be in-group bias and that in-group bias was a survival mechanism it's not and and getting getting people on top of it isn't something that we should be so you know woke scoldy about in this world i mean it, so many of these different ideas are things that were just dumped on people yesterday, basically. And they, the old ones didn't come because like a top-down religion forced it on people. That's, that's the other lie of the whole worldview. The, the, the religion, more than likely, in my evolutionary view of stuff, kind of tried to start explaining out why different things made sense that, that people fell into biologically. Yeah. Like, look and de detangle yourself from dogmatic views. And so Get curious. Get curious is what it's Get all curious. about. I detangled yeah. myself from all the problematic ideas I had. <laughs> oh, every single one. No, She's yeah. finished. <laughs> oh, okay, Bye. Buddha. Enlighten <laughs> us. Turn into a rainbow before my eyes, enlightened one. <laughs> uh, they sometimes do. And you'll still learn something. Mushrooms lie. You'll still yeah. learn something. <laughs> when it comes to our predetermined number of years, I sometimes feel like I'm past my expiration date. No. I do feel that way. Like today. It's like uh, Kolchak. Carl Kolchak says in the first night's doctor movie. He says, I become extinct in my own lifetime. Way to bring us down. I thought that would appeal to your nihilistic sensibilities. No. Actually, you guys want to hear something? No. What? Nihilism, free will, deter like determinism and nihilism is why I am also here today. Not only because I mentioned free will kind of got me off. Jesus is my God. <laughs> I want to thank Jesus for bringing me here today. Of the Mormon yeah. track. But, and then you have to have a certain amount of like nihilism to see yourself as like, I'm not a spirit daughter. I'm not a chosen. Like all of that shit that you're like, oh, I'm not part of like the really cool kids club that got the gospel. And you're like, well, what is the point of life and everything? And I think everyone has to go through like a little bit of a nihilist phase of like, what's the meaning of it all? But I literally, I don't want to get a tattoo, but I really do just want to, I wear the circle every single day to remind me that life is like a circle because it's pointless. All time Ooh. and eternity. So the, they say all that. And then I remember on, there was a Mormonism and transhumanism episode, which I was maybe going to try to pull up at one point, but I just can't keep up with these guys. I wish I could, because I really do have things to point on each one. But there was a moment where those transhumanist Mormons, I pointed out on, I made a post on some Mormon thing, but I pointed out in it that the Mormons were the nihilists and these nihilists were the, were the uh, religious because the Mormons were the ones talking about that, that baby's genetics and the codes that we can reprogram and actually really get into hacking in a transhuman world is just is just a bot and a being and we need to go about creating better bots and beings for the future that can outlive and survive eternity and if you really look at that that's nihilistic like they don't really think there's a soul in there they don't think anything's going on except that we're just these bots that we could create and we could create some sort of bots that would maybe keep our own existence even my own personal um, thought patterns going for for eternity in something less perishable like my like my human body and she got upset at that and said, well, when I have a baby, I don't just look at this baby and say, look at these nice little molecules and all that stuff put together. Like she, she exposed herself like right there that she sees something more in the baby than, than this life is pointless thing. But that's what the idea is that the nihilistic concepts, they help you get out of the negative, like they're your atonement out of the negative, but they're terrible answers for the positive things. This, yeah. that little circle, life is fucking pointless. All I got to do is hold your baby in front of your face for two seconds and you're going to back the hell off of that. <laughs> well, don't worry about yeah, the tattoo. No, that's, it's already that's another one, the Hitchens thing. Because, you know, what? every time he was accused of basically being a nihilist and he brings up, like, you know, like, no, I held my infant child and realized instantly <laughs> yeah. that, like, someday I had to die and I had to die in order to make room for this thing, you know, and, and thus, and suddenly like everything about my life became about this thing, you know, like, yeah. There's, there's a level of it too. Like I do believe some people are kind of mentally able to, the Peterson line is almost nobody can get there. I do think some people actually, and it doesn't mean you have to go become murderous or something like that, but I do believe some people actually do start being in the world in a fully nihilistic way. Like I said, I think those yeah. Mormons were almost more actual nihilists than she was. The only yeah. problem is, is most people going and spouting this nihilism stuff are doing the new agey crap. It's not a nihilism. It's just another new age religion. Yeah. And I, so, I mean, one of my creepy obsessions in trying to understand the worst aspects of humanity is that I have consumed an enormous amount of the writings of various mass shooters yeah and and like like these are the things these are your warning signs if they say i hate the world and i am god that combination 
<laughs> I can tell you after having read various mass shooters, like that combination is the bad one. I hate the world. I am God. Watch what, out. <laughs> what's scary about so many of these fake nihilists nowadays is they've got that I hate the world part of them. They've got this, I hate these humans that are polluting things. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah. And they don't have the fully fleshed out level of I am God, but they're getting to this level of I can change things. I can create things. I can engineer it from the top down, which only takes like another level or two for it to go. Uh, yeah, I'm God. And then yeah. you got the, uh, you got the connection. I mean, like that, you. that direct sentence, I am God or I am like God. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've read that from completely disparate shooter types that left their remainders to tell us why they did it. Well, not to panic people, but I, I think if you, like, look down at the people who do kind of hold some of the uh, keys and screws of the top of our society have hit the level of I hate society and I have some abilities to start changing the knobs on large uh, levels, God yeah. level stuff. And that's That's what Stalin was about. That's yeah. what Hitler was about whether you're going to choose to get one or not. I do. I do. Again, can I do another millennial reference that you guys don't get? There's, again, I'm falling asleep in bed last night. Hi, AF, by the way. Great realization. Had a great time. But I got the AF part, by the way. Thanks. The kids okay. get it out there. But, like, there's this uh, movie from uh, 19, 1989, Teen Witch. It was played on the Disney Channel my entire life. Top of that. Top of that. You guys know what I'm talking about. Teen Witch. Fabulous movie. If anyone hit me up on Instagram later, and we'll wrap it back and forth. But there's This is new age as hell this really beautiful part where she gets this necklace that she needed to become a witch the teenager she needed the necklace to become a witch for her powers to work and she is like a reincarnated teenage witch and her drama teacher tells her that like it found its way to you like it if it's meant to be it'll find its way to you and that's just like i get really much kira you are not a six out of seven atheist i'm sorry <laughs> my number one problem in life is having anxiety over needing to remember a lot of things because i can't just enjoy a podcast i can't just enjoy a book because i'm so anxious all the time that i have to remember everything and be able to say it on mormonism live on march 16th one day or something but just being like if these ideas like these thoughts and stuff i can't just i can't this, letting go of this illusion of control that like i can always remember i can always be in charge of everything and just literally teen witch changed my life because it's like you know what these things if it's meant to be it'll come back and i don't need to i don't need to just like strangle myself always trying to keep yeah. all of these ducks in a row the ring wants to he sounds you know. like someone explaining to a mormon why god didn't answer their prayers the way they asked <laughs> Yeah, well, he just says right there. The last, that's actually where I had the clip ending. Was oh, the ring? Sorry, wants, I interrupted. <laughs> the ring wants to be found, Kara. You know, he just says it. Uh, I think oh. he's kind of hinting at the uh, some Tolkien there. Yeah, the ring wants to be found, Kara. Uh, I mean, I do think he is kind of needling at her that she's she's gone full uh, New Agey right I, there. Yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't. Know, did you just? I watched a. Uh, Midnight Mormons had Stephen C. Meyer on. The yeah, I saw your comment on it. Yeah, like, <laughs> like it's just like, oh damn it! Like well, they're getting into the uh, intelligent, intelligent design, design stuff. But I, I've actually watched some of those uh, other critiques of Darwinism from Hillsdale College. Some of those guys talking about it, and I think there's there is some interest in some of those critiques being. Ah, we we got some things to, still to figure out, you know. But, yeah, no, but yeah, that whole thing just betrayed total misunderstanding. But that thing's like with Stephen Meyer. That's a guy who like I don't know. I I I, it's hard for me to give him credit that he's being sincere. I think. I don't know. <laughs> I, guess, I don't know him at all. I mean, let's uh, see. I, I it was a round table. I watched a round table of people who pointed to criticisms of darwinistic evolution on a hillsdale college episode and he might have been one of the ones that was on there yeah but. i know like because aaron raw takes issue even with the word darwinism he's like there's no darwinism in science there's evolutionary biology through you know natural selection what well, i don't i forget how it all goes but but yeah the, the idea that there is an actual ism that's being that here too I actually kind of tend, to, although it's become a colloquialism, but I th usually think when people are talking about Darwinism, it, it's actually a little bit more like that directed equilibrium type thing in the in the sense of a, it's a moment where action is being taken by a, a being or an animal or a group of animals that, that are going to affect evolution. It's like there's more action in it than just yeah. let, letting things uh, float. And, well, and then um, also, I mean, that's, there's the language, just the nomenclature issue where you kind of have to let people, like you have to let non-technical people use the words wrong because otherwise you'll just spend forever trying to so sort it out you know because yeah. like yeah you have to say okay i'm assuming you mean biological evolution as you mean it not darwinism because <laughs> yeah well, i mean everywhere usually, you run into that 
the other thing when people use, I mean, I'll use it the same way when saying Darwinism uh, colloquially, you're usually talking about things dying out. This is, well, Darwin, Darwinism, those yeah. died out, those went out, those went out, those died out, those killed out. Or, um, yeah, like there's a common thing, like like in the wine world, like regular consumers of wine talk about, is this wine dry? And they're usually talking about tannins. Hmm. And dryness has nothing to do with tannins. In in the knowledgeable wine world, dryness is just about sugar. And tannins are a separate thing. But, you know, when you're talking to regular people, like, well, I don't like wine when it's very dry. You have to translate that into regular speak from knowledgeable speak. Yeah. And, yeah, so, like, that's the one issue with the, I don't know, that's the problem. Anyway. So this thing going to spoil the Netflix series Midnight Mass. If you, if you, uh, yeah. I'm not worried about it. Okay. Didn't even know such a show existed until you said it just now. Is it good? Red Letter Media raved about it. I, did I, I miss watched that? It probably. They did a whole episode on it. I I like this director. He's the director of Haunting Hill House and Haunting a Bly Manor. I think he's going to do something every single year. Yeah, I do want to watch this. And every single year he does um, kind of like a little mini series that's kind of a haunted mini series type thing. And some people are saying this is his best yet. Most people are because they, they fall in love with this thing. I put it as my third favorite of the three, yeah, and uh, I, I wasn't. I got. I gotta watch either. these. I don't want this thing that makes me crazy about myself. Is that, like I always want to watch great movies, but I don't want to watch anything new by myself. So like, like this literally this afternoon, I'm like, oh, I gotta put something on while I do exercise, and I'm like scrolling through stuff. I'm like, oh, Shawshank Redemption. I probably haven't seen that in 20 years. It's a classic. And then I keep going, and I ended up settling on some terrible, cheap <laughs> horror movie that has yet to have a scare. I'm halfway through, and it's only 80 minutes long. <laughs> I do the same thing all the time. You know? I see all these. I actually see these, like, classics, and I do get to some. I get to them. I get to classics. And I look at them and say, I, I should watch that one to say that I've watched. Like, I went and watched Liberty Valance after you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, and now I remember Midnight Morns. Or Midnight Morns. Now I remember RLM talking about this movie. But, like, the way they talk about a movie, like, for me, it's just like, it's like oh, I don't want to go on a roller coaster all by myself. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, and so I never, and never, I don't ever watch it because you know I don't. So, see so this, the reason Paul's talking about it, and I think it's kind of true, is like the the show is doing a little bit of maybe what Kara's doing, even on some level. It's kind of like this, uh, this atheistic religion. It's it's blending the atheism and the religionism together, kind of purposefully. And um, it's got an interesting concept. I love the concept. I just didn't love how it played out. Yeah. I can barely hear that. You can't hear him? I'm sharing it on the wrong screen. Hold oh, on. Okay. No. Let me start that over too because I don't want to share that screen. It's good that it goes quiet so that we know if, we, if I did that. Whoa. Infinite regression. It's the ceiling room. I see myself. It turned on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time you've been back to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're doing all church. We just got to go back to the. I saw myself right there, extending into the future and the past forever. The infinities and infinities, and now we're gonna we're gonna have a nihilistic infinity moment right here, which is kind of what what Paul's pointing at in this show. I remember when I was really young and I heard about the ceiling room with the great big wall sized mirrors opposing opposing each other. I thought that's so cool. It is kind of cool. Just not that cool. It just wasn't. Uh, the mirrors weren't as big as I thought they'd be. But. Yeah. This is a sophisticated piece of mythology. Midnight Mass is, and so much of the show just has this layer of 19th century Christian hymnody. And while she's dying there, after the big baddie is trying to fly away with his crippled wings, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Is what's playing in the background now. Because I'm a Christian minister, almost all of the hymns that they play, they play the, the popular ones. I recognize all the hymns. I know the words are, because I've been formed by these cultures, the words are in my mind when they play. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? If they're just playing the soundtrack, the words are running through my mind. So I'm watching her die. I'm watching her with her flashbacks where she's sitting on the couch with her love interest, and she's basically unfolding the world. So what is the world? What is the story? What is the truth? Remember, religion is the thing beneath. So we've got vampires. We've got Catholic mass. We've got a priest who made some bad decisions early in his life and late in his life, and actually while he and the woman that had dementia, and he's revived her with his blood and the blood of the empire, the empire, the vampire. And their daughter gets killed by the people of the town. 
Um, and then he basically renounces the priesthood because, well, you know, romantic love is the renunciation of everything. But it's religion. What's true? What's the truest? What's the most true thing? And it's right there in, you know, the last quarter of the, the last quarter of the last episode of the show. Life is a dream. Life is a wish. We're made of stardust. Um, I'm all of it. I'm everything. I am that I am, she says. Now, of course. It's kind of getting into that new agey nihilism is still a religion type stuff. Like yeah. they, they hear that stardust stuff from Cosmos and then they imagine that in this way of like, well, then that stardusty stuff is going to be like magic sprinkles that uh, we're going to float through for the eternities and it is still going to be an atonement. Uh, yes, you makers of Midnight Mass. You do know your Bible fairly well, although some of the quotes that you pour out throughout the movie on the lips of, of shallow-minded, simplistic religious people are often the ones that are sort of trotted out when someone wants to establish a little bit of um, credentials in terms of Bible knowledge, like two Corinthians or something like that. I am that I am? Oh, I get the message. Yeah, I get it. I listen to the whole speech. I understand happy nihilism. It's exactly what Sam Harris is offering. Well, I'm dying here. I've actually won the victory. I've shredded the vampire's wings. He likely won't be able to escape, but you know what? It doesn't matter. Life is a dream. I am everything. Now, here's the problem with this. They didn't say that when they were on a meaningful mission to stop evil. It didn't matter. It mattered when they had to birth. When Kara and John Lynn are on their meaningful mission to stop evil, it doesn't matter. Like the boat, huh. vampires were going out into the world. It mattered when she basically sacrificed her life in order to shred the vampires' wings to stop the vampires from going to the mainland. All of the lives on the mainland mattered. The world mattered. Everything mattered. And with your nice, pretty, nihilistic speech, you undercut the whole thing. And that's the problem. You cut out the good with the bad with that speech. Because if the tragedies don't matter, neither do the glories. You got to understand that with nihilism. <laughs> like, yeah. You kind of pick and choose and like either or stuff. Like you're not really a nihilist if the if you're only reverting to the nihilism to to get out of the bad, you know. You want to do a little Larson? Yeah, let's do some Larson. That was another one I should have taken notes on. Cuz what was yeah. one of them was that uh, like <laughs> that, well, I think I sent you the link about it where they like, talking about like oh, re redefining terms. That's that's a red flag. The, the next day Mormon stories, redefining sexuality with Margie Delin. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see the message got through. Every single stinking thing it's always just has like an immediate, you know. Uh. <laughs> but these guys get upset. That I I explained it to somebody else earlier today that in this second half, these guys really get upset that they're starting to notice that some Mormon apologists are using postmodern arguments for their for their apologetics, and these guys go after it. And I don't think they realize that they're going after postmodernism, which is where the engine that justifies most of the whole world beliefs of those non-scientific concepts that they want us to all have a bleeding heart for to just believe in. And I mean, with any one of these things, RFM, these guys, whatever, when I say it's like, it's hardcore science for thee, but for whatever thing I infantilize with my empathy, with my big old empathy, as soon as I infantilize something, that thing now no longer has to live up to any of the science. There's so much. I'm going to start. This was the first thing I noticed because I was trying to listen. Each time I go in, I'm going to say, I'm going to listen with an open mind and see if I disagree. And I got 30 minutes in without being like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, that's like for me, his rundown of basic logical fallacies is good. It's solid. Just the part that gets me is like, that Johns, are you feeling anything? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to shape whole narratives not around it's these fun. people that don't exist it's kind of like the the leadership of antifa they <laughs> exist john larson they yeah. exist yep. <laughs> i've got a not only to follow andy no i and forgot all one. about that but like holy shit that one got that me. was the first thing you said like oh come on dad like what what news sources are you gargling on? oh that was a, the one now that brings one up because you know because like he keeps bringing up fox and conservatives every time as an yeah, example that's the second and then at one point he says like you know and the left does this too and like if i had him in the room i would say okay john larson can you give me three examples of how the left they never they never reasoning? do it but that is a type two error. Type one is there's you think something there and it's not there. 
type two is it is there and you think it's not there. Yeah, and that's and a type two. <laughs> he's type two error right there. John Larson, get better news sources. Yeah. Check out Andy Noll's book. He's got it labeled out through and through and through, and it's undeniable. He burned down the straw man. Um, uh, Fox News does this incessantly. <laughs> so yeah. um, what they do unlike, is unlike other news. It. MSNBC's never once yeah, done that. Ever. Fox News is the major network that does this incessantly. Liberals so do this and liberals do that. Um, and but there's who? What liberals? What who? Who we? And very about? frequently, like like the concept that people always like Jonathan Haidt talks about. You brought up the uh, deal that the left hates the concept of stereotypes, but very frequently. The problem is the actual science of stereotypes is that there's some truth to it. And it's the same thing with this situation. Like there's also a fallacy that you didn't cover on here, John Larson, which is called the fallacy fallacy. And that is that sometimes your fallacy doesn't doesn't work or doesn't make sense in this situation. It's not actually it's not actually the fallacy going on that you think is going on. And some of those times Fox News is doing what you're saying. Some of those times they're absolutely right that in general, the general concept of the left or liberals are in general acting a certain way or doing a certain thing. Yeah. Well, this is kind of like that thing I was talking about earlier where like you have to allow the colloquial meaning f to make so the conversation can advance because otherwise you just strip meaning from everything and nothing gets, but yeah. And also like, don't pretend like you don't know what Fox is talking about when they talk about the left. Yeah. All right. All right. What's next? All right. Forward ho. So, yes. so, John, I'll, I'll just jump That's in That's a really green quick. screen um, bricks, isn't it? Yeah. It seems like uh, when I was growing up in the church, uh, what the way that this argument uh, manifested to me was that the church there would give go. that prophecy about Daniel and the stone cutting out of the mountain without hands, and the church would talk about its kind of exponential growth, and they would release those videos of, like, temples dotting the globe. And I, I feel like the assumption was if the church is growing, if the missionary program is growing, if uh, you know, if, if people are swarming to the true church, then somehow that that implies that it's true. That's that's the whole concept. The only reason I hit on it is that this is a deeper concept than you guys make it. Um, the whole thing, fruits of their by the fruit you shall know them type stuff, and it's where Peterson and Harris spent days on arguing. It's the arguments of the new pragmatists in philosophy, William James and C.S. Pierce, that since we have such a difficulty of defining truth or figuring out truth there's types of truth in the world and empirical truth is one type of truth but this is one of those levels i talk about the darwinistic truth or the sense of these these are things that tend to survive the pragmatic truth is pragmatism as a uh, we talked about with uh, brett weinstein point, pointing out to it with rogan with, pork, with the porcupines yeah oh. the, the the concept that uh maybe it wasn't exactly true that the porcupines throw their quills but it was a useful concept that held true that kept people from getting poked by porcupines to stay away from the porcupines. And that that's a simplistic little idea, but there's larger scale civilizational ideas or things that, that probably lead towards more survival. And yeah. it's true that they will lead towards more survival. And that is going to be everyone's justification for masks. When yeah. the science comes out, and it finds out they're going to say, no, no, like it was a useful lie. They will they will do the pragmatic truth. And it happens right now to Ukraine already. There's all sorts of stuff that comes out as like some hero story and it comes out as not true. And they say, you should have held on to the myth and the belief and the truth of that for uh, the patriotism of it. And these guys will jump onto pragmatic truths all the time themselves. But there is a, another level that in the philosophical world, trying to land on what truth is where if you get deep into epistemology, you find out it's very, very hard to land on anything that's truth outside of some very, very easy to narrow in on empirical evaluations like at what heat water boils at or something like that. All other truth gets very philosophically complicated. And one of those complications is the, comp the concept of what survives, what lives, what continues, what grows. And so it's not it's not so simple. You're both you're both right. And in, to, to quote the Coen brothers, would the tour so simple? Would the tour so simple? You got another one? Yeah. You have to go fast because I got a bunch I can skip to better ones. Actually, I've so, got a few minutes. So any conclusion you make about ghosts is fallacious. None of that equipment is real because you first have to establish that ghosts exist. This goes back to our God problem that we talked about. It suffers from a huge fallacy problem. Yeah. Nobody has actually defined what the word God means. 
So if any I, property that you have you established having, that transgender people exist, John? Because you've acknowledged their existence. You tell us that you believe in that. He does the same thing with the word faith and all that stuff. And like you were just saying a minute ago, Derrida, and I think one of these problems with these guys, one of the, the concepts they don't get, they haven't gone into the work of realizing that the meanings deferred and the postmodernists have all these concepts of what is truth that they haven't evaluated with. And in the second half of this, they don't realize the apologists have gotten into stuff. This is one of the areas where I say, I feel like Larson and the Lynn and RFM are 10 years behind on these concepts. Like they don't even, they don't get into like how much of an epistemological problem we've gotten into by tossing what, what Verveke calls like a center perception, like a religion, like the, uh, a society has a center perception that we all center around for our truth making. As soon as that gets spread out, it immediately breaks into a postmodern problem of what is truth. And I think these guys think that the scientific world has it covered as, as much as they do, and they don't realize all the challenges that are going into it in their own people that they will empathize and sympathize and run all the cover in the world for on their own side because they infantilize them. And so they perpetuate all the stuff that can't hold up to their hard, hard, hard science that they want Meldrum to hold to. And so we got to prove it. We got to prove it right here. Flip and I were there in Mormon expressions. He was just talking about ghosts. Here's a little bit more of it with ghosts. Yeah, I was there that day. The Ghost Hunter show I was watching. This shows how, how stupid human beings are, what I'm about to tell you. So for a lot of years, they would put up these boom mics in these supposedly haunted houses, right? And the audio quality was not... I would say you got out of time, but he goes into ghosts there and he talks about yeah. how ridiculous ghosts are. In the Mormon Expression episode that they probably have available in the archives, he brought on his new girlfriend who's not with anymore. We know her. She's kind of a local famous person around Salt Lake here who's also yeah, a... Yeah, she's one of the... She's big in the local art scene. Big in the local arts, big in the local... Kind of push all like the transgender... Um, yeah. Into the uh, society. Well, you can't be big in the art scene unless you're big in the woke scene. Yeah, and like actually activistic pushing stuff into like arts festivals and type of stuff like into the woke scene. She got on the site and we started talking about like ghosts and that ghosts were, were obviously not true. She pushed back pretty hard that she was kind of a full believer and that she was a ghost. And then after a couple of years of watching John Larson, just kind of assuming he was going to be a hard line scientist about this stuff just immediately starts apologizing for her and lets it yeah. go and lets it ride and lets it all happen. <laughs> I was just, stunned. I was really stunned watching that. We were all sitting there and he started trying to help her make arguments and all that type of stuff. And it just goes to show when you empathize with the, with a person, you start letting them get away with all sorts of stuff or do all those sorts of things. But this is, this is my deal too. It's like with the transgender stuff or with the ghost believers or with the religion believers, I let them get away with that stuff too pretty equally. I let them all get away with it as far as they're not forcing it on somebody yeah. else. Exactly. That's the big that's the big ticket. And that's one of the my biggest gripes with the way Dylan and Kara talk and the Wokies generally is that they play this game that, you know, and it's the same thing that Mormons and Muslims and everybody, every other religious person does, which is if you don't affirm my pet beliefs, that is an offense to me and my existence. And that that's a dangerous lie, you know, because like the Muslim justification for burning nuns in the street is that if a Danish cartoonist draws Muhammad, that's offending me personally. You're trying to erase me. You know? so, so so to break it down on levels, I mean, I thought about it, like the transgender thing. I know transgender people in my life, and they're great. They're awesome people, and I'm fully on board with them. Totally. I hate they. I don't think that they're allowed to go make Rod Meldrum um, agree with and say everything that they want Rod Meldrum would say. I don't think Rod Meldrum gets to go tell them that they need to agree with Rod Meldrum and everything that he exactly. has to say. And, and, but one of the reasons why it becomes like a problem, they're going to talk about the God of the gaps here in a second. And one of the things that atheism and unstoppable invented in the whole critical race theory world is the racism of the gaps thing that yeah. there's, there's all these concepts that, that we don't need to prove these things. Like you saw Kara do when she was chastising Rod Meldrum saying, stop thinking about evidence, stop thinking about quantifying stuff. There's just a racism of the gaps. The problem with that is I'd even let the, I wouldn't even have a problem of race theorists believing that if they weren't using it as actionable law making things forcing it on other people forcing that you can believe that all you want to believe that you can believe all the critical race theory you want but as soon as you start trying to take action with it we got to get scientific you, even in the transgender world even in the rod meldrum world all that sort of stuff 
fine and dandy for any sort of beliefs. I, I will back you, you up having your own beliefs and all that sort of stuff. As soon as you start pushing it into the, the policy world, now we got to get hardcore about it. But you, John Larson, this has been my complaint with you from the start. It's the reason I said we need one to argue with you. And you said, what are you talking about? Is that you infantilize. You, you do not want to hold anybody you infantilize to the same thing that you want to hold the Mormon church. And you guys will start using like the cause harm, cause harm, cause harm. So if you didn't have it, because I've got a little thing, kind of a little thing, because mm. just – Again, in my weird adventures where I just try to learn stuff I didn't know, the Yazidis. Do you remember the Yazidis? The Yazidis, there's like one or two million Yazidis, and they are a Kurdish ethno-religious group, uh, Kurdish-speaking, I should say, ethno-religious group uh, that mostly live in Iraq. And you might remember that there was a minor genocide committed against them by ISIS and all this stuff. I was just learning about Yazidis because that's just my nature. I got into their religion and their sacred texts. Now, with the following caveats, that the Yazidis are extremely secretive about their scripture, and that this is from a, a, a Muslim source from 100 years ago, and the Muslims are not necessarily pro-Yazidi. But this is supposed to be um, a little bit out of the Yazidi creation myth, which is interesting because it, it starts out, God creates a pearl. And then he creates a magic bird, and it's sort of interesting because like it, uh, it's a lot like stuff you recognize, where like on the first day Sunday, God creates the chief god, but then in Yazidism, every other day of the week, he creates other gods. But this is where it gets interesting: is that he creates Adam and Eve, <clears throat> and Adam was sad because he was all alone. God commanded Gabriel to create Eve. Eve and he makes Eve and all the animals and Adam and Eve quarreled over the question whether the human race should be descended from him or her. Now I'm reading from it for each wish to be the sole begetter of the race. This quarrel originated in, in their observation of the fact that among animals, both the male and the female were factors in the production of their reproductive species. After a long discussion, Adam and Eve agreed on this. Each should cast his seed into a jar, close it and seal it with his own seal and wait for nine months. When they opened the jars at the completion of this period, they found in Adam's jar two children, male and female. Now from these two, our sect, the Yazidis, are descended. In Eve's jar, they found naught but rotten worms emitting a foul odor. And God caused nipples to grow for Adam that he might suckle the children that proceeded from his jar. This is the reason why man has nipples. After this, Adam knew Eve, and she bore two children, male and female, and from these, the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, and other nations and sects are descended. But our first fathers are Sheth and Noah, and Enosh, the righteous ones, who were descended from Adam only. And then later on, they emphasize this point that they are literally different. Now, I wonder if John and John and Kara would have the guts for even an instant to explain everything or, that's wicked and evil and irrational and wrong. Or Radio Free Yazidi Mormon. Religion, especially, or Radio Free Mormon. That was my argument from the first Radio Free Mormon <laughs> debate. I said, if you had a critical race theorist sitting there in front of you, or a religion of some people you've infantilized sitting there in front of you, would yeah. you be Mr. Hardcore, take them down? Yeah. Said, no, you wouldn't. Like, this really, is, Yazidis? Do better. Do better, Yazidis. <laughs> I know you're cutting short. I might I might <laughs> keep going if you have to keep going or not. Um, I don't want to come I can back go to a, Larson. I can go five more minutes. Okay. The, the, it, took, it took years of study and careful understanding to, to deprogram this shit. Because once you start, like you take take your scriptures and take a red pencil, you know, like we used to, and then start crossing out every word that that is an, an argument from from the gaps, from the ignorance. It's an argument, it's reification. It's a, it's the assuming properties of something that has never been established. And by the end of the day, you'll have redlined out eighty percent of that book. Guess guess where you can do that, John Larson. That's been an argument. Guess I can bring some books to you. I'd love you to take your marker to them and start point, pointing out logical fallacies to me. And they get called academia. They get called academia. I mean, libraries of them libraries of them. we don't know too much but john has said he has two transgender kids like that tell there's no way you've gone down that road without making ten thousand logical fallacies along the way it just can't be done at 123 2 he calls uh the covid vaccine a, a effing triumph of science <laughs> uh no polio vaccine was a triumph of science the covid vaccine was a big fart yep okay Here's a... It's not based in any kind of science, but he presents it, wrapping himself in the language of science, wrapping himself in the language of history, as if this is something that's not just fiction. That's Foucault. But the fact that... Guess how much branches have branched off of Foucault? That it's not communicable 
to anybody who's not already in that paradigm shows that the paradigm is probably not true. Oh my goodness. Not communicatable to anybody who's not in the paradigm. Have you noticed that everybody shows. outside of wokeness is their first reaction is confusion? I've got books of PhD academic, academic PhD books for you, John Larson. And they're books that if Rod Meldrum read them, he'd be like, what is going on here? Mud, <laughs> mud moats. Totally. In this case, no problem. It is absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this, this is the definist, B-E-F-I-N-I-S-T fallacy. Um, this is basically uh, uh, insisting that your definition of a word is the correct one. <laughs> it, it, it is actually cousin. <laughs> Please, oh, please, what's the place to be talking about this? Please go all the way with this one at some point in your life. Please, yeah. chase please. this one all the way until you get to where just because. Um, um, to to reification, because what you do is is you define out the term the way you want it to be. Oh yeah, reification. You can make like the whole transgender, abstract. the whole the whole queer theory operation. Is Not queer theory, critical theory, all crit of critical yeah. theory, any single so there you one go. of yeah, them. Everything, all of it. You're right. Going all the way back. That's all reification right there. But like to take and chasing it down, transgenderism is reifying an idea. Larson, you've spelled out here what we've been screaming has taken over the humanities at the universities over the past 30 years. Taking it over and me not being some like draconian uh, authoritarian. I'd be fine if those people went and believed it, just like Rod Meldrum believed this stuff and everything. But get it out of the universities where things are supposed to actually be truth-based. Yeah. That's where Jonathan Haidt talks about things turned into activistic-based and not truth-based. These are the points I'm making. This is the thing that drives me crazy that people don't see it or know it or even have a clue of what's going on or, or too far behind to realize that this has taken off. You're talking like it's 2005 atheism and you don't realize yeah. that that... The university's already left you behind. That's what we yeah, keep trying and, to say. And you can tell because people coming out of universities believe, like, that's things. Like, you talk to an average college student today, and they genuinely believe that white people, that white people, specifically Americans, invented slavery. Like, that's really what they think, you know? Like, that's not an accident that they believe that. That's See, religion. Whoever, whoever wrote this, and they put that in, in their thing, they immediately kicked out of the program, right? Why? That sentence right there, right there. The fruits of apostasy are generally bitter. That's just so. You oh, have yeah. not read academics. You have not read academic papers. That's the other one. There's so what much is moralistic, just single sentence crap like that in academia. It will. It would. If you got, you would swell up to a to a blueberry like Willy Wonka, Willy Wonka and Chocolate Factory. If we stuffed all of the moralistic bullshit like that that I've read yeah. out of the humanities in academia, John Larson. And also, that's the other thing that struck me. I forgot about this. Is that like the way this thing that they're reading, the way the church talks about apostates, is how John DeLynn talks about his critics. Hurt people, hurt people. I think it's a fallacy, which is so hard for for people who are really seeking truth. I told you before, I, I have no religion other than I seek truth. And if you can prove me wrong, I will admit it. Liar. We tried. You blocked us. You, you smeared Chris Hanna. You won't talk to us. You're lying. Uh, no. What, would they have a new one? Yeah, they're changing. They're changing. They had, when I was at Utah State University, um, they had an entire two-day academic professional conference at an R1, Division I, major research university about what the word translation means. Oh, so are oh. you getting upset about these Deridian things, John? John, oh. is it is it something that you're just shaking your arms about and flipping it? Like, this is upsetting to you. This is the first time that's happened. In, you in don't like it when distance. people mess with words that bothers you? A when they start to obfuscate meaning? A two-day conference about a word? And maybe the word translation. How many, how many conferences do you think there's been about altering what the word racism means? Like, how many hours? How many man hours? How many dollars oh, yeah. has been put into... Well, like altering in definitions in our lifetimes we watch the definition of man and woman just so they have more maybe room. what joseph said he was translating he was meaning something else and richard bushman went to harvard Terrell gibbons was like you know as a professor harvard doesn't do any of this deridian stuff harvard doesn't do that no. so this is what i'm saying the, the this whole second half it almost goes on for like another 10 minutes of them just like losing their minds and then uh, saying that like i can't believe there's all this stuff where people are jacking with language discourse <laughs> who would are, do that what yeah, kind of person 
and call it academics they're calling it academics people messing with language and academics <laughs> i'm outraged and just i i what's going on how are and you some of happen? them are putting a moral imperative into it what kind of person who know better and should do better. Oh, that kind of person. There she is. They're yeah. religious people. They do what religious people do. If religion were true, we'd call it science. <laughs> if religion were true, we'd call it science. So oh, if I, queer I, theory I, was true, we'd call it biology. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> Aren't we undermining their arguments by calling into question their character and their integrity and their sincerity? I think I'm giving them an out. Yeah. You, you're saying they're sincere, and I'm saying it's not helping their case. You're, you're saying, okay, there's these guys out here. Nice to hear I you say cool that, John. It's not well, helping your case fair. that you believe your bullshit. Yeah, you, you leave me in the spot all the time saying, like, are you just dumb? Are you ignorant? Are you just a midwit? Or are you purposefully being evil? You know, the same question everybody always asks. Like, So, yeah. I mean, I choose to believe, like Delin is trying to argue for there, that maybe they just don't, maybe you really believe and just feel this stuff and don't even understand how you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. But... That puts you at a level of, of me thinking that you're also kind of not able to grasp some things going on around you. They've read all this stuff. They know all this stuff, but they sincerely want to lean into the lie. Then my assassinating their character is better than my assassinating their intelligence, isn't it? Because either, either. Infinite question there, John DeLynn. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to pick between those. What was I doing to you? Was I, am I attacking your character or your intelligence? For people inside now. You know, when you, were, you were talking about why does the church vilify ex-Mormons? Because they vilify Mormons too. Like, why do you have to get a new temple recommend every two years? Why do you have to go to tithing settlement? Why do you have to constantly repent? Why do you have to confess your sins to the church? Listen to the way the church talks to its members. It doesn't like ex-Mormons. It doesn't trust ex it doesn't like Mormons. The whole point of the whole thing is that you're all worms and you all can't survive in life without us. Straw man? Was this a straw man fallacy? Yeah, mm. that's pretty, pretty bad And you'd all be broken, right there. rapey, and dead in a ditch if it weren't for the church. The church doesn't respect any of us. So it's the fact that these guys... He's being hyperbolic right there, but I mean, that's right where you go. This, these are a straw man fallacy. The power they have to promote this system, this destructive, terrible, harmful system. They need to Systems. go away. And they need to stop. And what... You're saving us. You're going to save us. Save Let's... me from the system. <laughs> oh my God, the systems are coming what from Carolyn inside Gilles the house. Gibbons are willing to say um, when they're at a special fireside that is limited people in attendance where there's no recorders being made, what Richard Bushman's willing to say in a basement at a faith again, uh, you know, get together in Salt Lake City, where he makes the comment that uh, that you know the pre prevailing narrative uh, is is incorrect, that it's not true, that it's broken, and that the brethren need to come up with a new prevailing narrative. Whenever you actually record what they're saying in private, and then share it publicly, they they go bananas. They lose, and they tell you that it's mean and rude to record. This this is where I made the argument that the reason like John Larson said he didn't want to talk about that stuff with me in the open, he wanted to talk about it over a beer, is because he wants a different public thing put yeah. out there. I bet you he might hedge on some of the stuff or admit that he knows of the double speaking the lie and the fallacies going on on that side, but he doesn't want to say it. And it. There's a there's a point in there where they say all oh, these guys they have to know they have to know that they're doing a double thing. Yeah, you know, I don't know. You guys always leave me wondering if you guys know or don't know. I'm kind of constantly. I mean, with John Delin, it's easier to guess doesn't know. It's I think easier so. to fall on that side. Then uh, Larson uh, mentioned they mentioned the word Trump calling anybody a rhino was was a fallacy, and I don't think that's true. Rhinos are real. Uh, Republicans in name only are. Yeah. That that's a real thing. It's, it's a category of people, sure. Uh, then he, meant, he he gives credit to Tal Bachman, which I think is interesting because I remember years later, like John earlier, John Larson put out this uh, this essay on, and he basically spelled out his Mar Marxist economic beliefs that all all society, all everything, and I think he kind of does it in this episode too, of saying everything is based and surrounded around economics and economic pressures and choices, and it really just comes out of like an economic uh, of a Marxist reading of everything. And I remember Tal Bachman ripped into him. Tal Bachman actually writes for Mark Stein's magazine or internet page. Mark, Tal Bachman's a pretty right leaning dude, but uh, um, I think he gives him credit here for something. Well, it's, it's we talked about it before. It's a house of cards, which is why people talk about an epiphany moment. When it starts to fall apart because you have all these assumptions you have to keep in your head and once you question those key assumptions as a great tal bachman once said is, is all you have to do is allow yourself to question that it may not be true and tal bachman ripped in john larson and said that his economics were basically written by a child but, uh, <laughs> um, let me see if i just find that last little last thing which we've already mentioned but just to show it because nobody listened that long <laughs> i'll also just uh remind our audience that 
we have set up a fund to pay for John Larson. And so if you value, we, we pay John Larson $1,000 an episode, uh, just like we do Simon Southerton out of respect for their expertise and their knowledge. And we need your donations to support that. So if you have donated to the Mormon Expression John Larson Fund, great. If you haven't, please go to mormonstories.org slash Mormon Expression. There's a donate button there. We'll include that in the show notes and maybe Kara or Jen will include that now in the comments. But How much uh, do we have to pay to not have to John DeLynn? <laughs> Can I donate to have just a yeah. different host? That's something I, I guess, I mean, I'd pay for that too. <laughs> you just saw this. Uh, See, like, you ever been to one of those dueling piano things where, you know, somebody can pay $10 for the piano guy to play one thing. Yeah. And you, pay 50, you can pay 15 to make him stop. <laughs> Look at this. I just Googled logical fallacies. They even got like helpful little sheets of them and all that sorts of stuff. And uh, that, give me a thousand bucks. <laughs> eh, people like John, he's a draw. Yeah, that's the point of it. Yeah. Um, Although, again, like, why are you a five hundred one c three? I think he says something about. Wait, let's hear it. No, I think the world costs money, and um, that's for most of us. It's the only thing we have to influence things around. So you need to decide where your money is going to go and what kind of things you want to support. This sort of stuff is hard. It takes a lot of time. Takes a lot of energy. And um, if you want quality, um, then you need to you need to pay something. Um, I don't I don't know what. To me, it's sort of obvious. There's this weird ex-Mormon thing um, where, for some reason, they don't want people to get paid for their, their work that they want to consume. Yeah, that's an ex-Mormon thing. Tragic, really. <laughs> what a weird thing to say. <laughs> Peeling for the, the the money and stuff. But send out all your money to Flip if anybody sent us some. I don't, um, but it yeah. takes time and work. And Flip's got to get going to work. And he stayed 16 minutes long for it. So. Yeah, I should be fine. So send money. This costs money and the crumbs. And, and we're Marxists, so we don't believe in money. But uh, send us all the money and uh, stop yeah. the conspicuous capitalism by sending us uh, all the money. Although I don't think there's a way to send us money. So. And you want to have empathy, don't you? <laughs> have empathy. If you want to be, to if work. you want to be the kind of person that has empathy, there's a strange you, thing about. You need to support what we do. There's a strange thing about people listening who don't want to send money. I don't know what that's about. Yeah, what the hell? What kind of person doesn't <laughs> think I deserve money for this? If you want quality. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, I better bounce later. See you.